One day, a little boy went to the grocery store and wanted a box of laundry detergent. The grocer thought it was rather suspect and asked the little fella um, what he wanted it for. He said he wanted to wash his cat with it. The uh, grocer said, well, son, that's not what you'd use to wash your cat. But the kid was undeterred, bought his box of uh, laundry detergent, and left. About uh, four days later, the little boy came back to the store and the grocer was uh, concerned. He said, how's your cat doing? The uh, little boy said he died. The grocer said, didn't I warn you not to use that detergent to wash the cat? The little boy said, the detergent didn't hurt him a bit. The spin cycle got him. <laughs> For those of us who hate cats, laugh really loud for me. Okay, that's right. <clears throat> If you will, the Corinthians are in the spin cycle, starting in chapter 1 and verse 10 all the way through to chapter 4 and verse 21, they were experiencing divisions. One would say, I'm of Paul, another I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and uh, Paul says, you guys got issues, you've got to get that worked out. You go over to chapter 5, they had an incestuous relationship going on in their church, so Paul deals with that. And then it goes from bad to worse because in chapter 6, they were suing one another in secular law courts. And then as you move forward to chapter 7, they had questions about marriage and divorce and celibacy. And now the section we're dealing with begins in chapter 8, verse 1 on Christian liberty. And last week we saw, beginning in chapter 10 in verse 1, all the way through verse 13, that the Corinthians had a model that they needed to consider the nation of Israel. What had Israelites experienced? Great privileges. Remember that? Which privileges did they have? Wow. God led them. Remember when it was time during the day to move on? The cloud picks up. It would go in a certain direction and the nation would pack up and follow God. And if it was at night, God would send a fire and the pillar of fire would lead the nation. That's a privilege to be led that way, is it not? They all had experienced a tremendous deliverance. God parted the Red Sea and the Israelites passed through as on dry ground. And then when the Egyptian soldiers followed, they were crushed in the waters. They knew a supernatural deliverance. They were fed supernaturally. They were given drink supernaturally. God had done so many things for them. How about the Corinthians? They lacked no spiritual gift, chapter 1, verse 7. And yet, what did they need to learn from the nation of Israel? It's this lesson. All began to race, did they not? All that passed through the Red Sea had the privilege one day, if they did things right, to enter into the promised land of Canaan. Think about this, everybody. Uh, Numbers chapter 1 tells us there were 603,550 adult men. Not counting Levites. If you put it all together, there are about two to three million Israelites. Now, just take the number of 600,000. How many adult men got to go into the promised land? They defined adulthood by 20 years of age and older. How many out of the 600,000 got to experience the life in Canaan? The answer, two. Joshua and Caleb. And although the Corinthians were a privileged people, they needed to finish the race. And though you and I are a privileged people, we need to finish the race as well. But we have an adversary. He's called Satan. And he has a lot of allurements he brings our way to entice us to move away from God. And he does this through idolatry. Setting up idols that we might worship in order to get off track from the true God. So we want to talk about idolatry today. And the Israelites of old had fallen into, if you will, Satan's snare, had bought into idolatry time and time again. And why is it today we should not follow their model and flirt with the idols of our age? Pick it up with me, please. 1 Corinthians now chapter 10 beginning in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, no new temptation is under the sun. Father, idolatry has been around in your allurements that move men and women towards that direction since the beginning of the time. And they will continue to be here, Father, as long as we have a sun and moon and stars. Help us to understand how good our true God is and keep our eyes solely upon him. May your sweet spirit of God this morning speak to every heart. Would you search the recesses of our hearts to make sure that we don't have another God sitting on the throne of our hearts. And if we do, Father, expose that sin today. And may we confess that before we leave here. I ask in the name of the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Paul commands the Corinthians in verse 14 very simply, flee from idolatry. Run away from it. You have to remember the Corinthians' background here. They came from a system of paganism. They had the temple that was in Corinth with a thousand prostitutes. And part of the worship, if you will, part of the sacrificial system included that gross immorality. So when Paul was saying, flee from idolatry, he is reminding the Corinthians that none of them should go back and participate in the things that they had formerly done. Yeah. That is why back in chapter 6 and verse 18, we had another flee command. Do you remember what it was? Flee sexual immorality. Sexual morality. Can I ask you this morning this? What is your greatest fear? And what you worship by the way, has a lot to say about you. Fear and worship, how do they work together? Pastor uh, Justin Buzzard uses the following assessment to determine if there is an idol that is lurking in your hearts. Consider these four areas. See, because I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, I don't go down to the local shrine. I don't bow down before any of the idols there. I don't have any idols in my life, but there are other idols. By the way, anything that sits on the throne of your heart and replaces the true God is an idol. The first one he cites is control. You know you have a control idol if your greatest nightmare is uncertainty. You can't control the future. You don't know what it holds. And since you want to be in control of everything, you wig out over it. Number two, approval. You know you have an approval idol if your greatest nightmare is rejection. You want everyone to like you. You want everyone to pat you on the back. You want everyone to say, hey, you're the person. You just have to have approval. Hmm. The third idol that he exposes is that of comfort. You know that you have a comfort idol if your greatest nightmare is stress or demand. And by the way, this is part of our American culture today. Everybody just wants to retire early. Everybody wants a second home. Everybody wants to boat. They want to go out into life, and they just want to chill. No sweat, no problems. I just want to relax, right? Have we seen it? We see it over and over and over again in our culture today. So we have a comfort idol. Leave me alone. I just want to just kind of lounge. And then we also have the power idol. You know you have a power idol if your greatest nightmare is humiliation or embarrassment. Hmm. Can I tell you all something? We are all insecure people. It's part of the fall. 
Do you remember way back in Genesis chapter 3, God had already given to Adam and Eve so much. He had given them the Garden of Eden and all these trees to partake of. They had fellowship with him on a regular basis. Can you imagine taking a walk with God in the evening and having him explain who he is to you? But then they did the one thing that they should not do. They ate of the tree that they were commanded not to eat of. And God had told them very explicitly way back in 2.17, if you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. The word death is used twice there in the Hebrew text to show that you will certainly die. And they ate. And then God comes searching for them because remember, he was the one who regularly pursued them for fellowship. And by the way, God is on the prowl in your life. And you got to understand that he is pursuing you to have fellowship with you. He wants you and he to have a great relationship together. And as he's looking for Adam, they did the smart thing after they sinned. They hid themselves. Can you imagine? I mean, is, is that stupid? Well, you know, and God says, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was at. God was asking to give Adam a chance to come clean with the situation. And Adam says, we hid ourselves because we were afraid. First time fear appears in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10, when Adam and Eve sinned, he says, I'm afraid, Jireh is your Hebrew word. Do you know what? All of you, as well as me, we have fears. We have insecurities. Because of the fall, all of us have them. So we have a tendency because of fear, because of insecurity, to want to cling to something that will make us secure. And oftentimes, instead of running to the true God, we find the closest thing to us, a relationship. If I can get in a relationship, the relationship will make me feel secure. Right? Or we think money. If I can just master the stock market, if I can have just another thousand in my portfolio, if I can diversify a little bit more, then I'll be secure. And then some go to substances. They think it's the caffeine or the nicotine or the alcohol, and if I can just have that, it'll give me the fix that I need, and I'll be secure. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? And we miss it, and we create our own idol instead of running to the only one that can fill the void. See, your level of security only can be found in a relationship, a relationship with Almighty God. That's exactly right. We're told in 1 John chapter 4, and don't forget this, perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. In other words, when you have a great relationship with God, you can be very secure because, you know what, you don't need the approval of other people. And you don't need to be involved in an immoral relationship thinking that that's going to give you the stroke, that's going to give you the comfort, that's going to give you what you need because they're going to praise your beauty or praise your love or whatever. It's not just another dollar because you recognize that all things come from God and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Or it's not a substance because you know what? We ride on a high all the time. I grew up with a guy who lived around the corner from me. I can still picture his window and there was not one day in his life that he was not high. I can remember going off to school and he'd be sitting there in that window, bong in hand, firing it up. Why? Because that was his God. That was his idol. That's what kept him going. That was his dependence. Only a relationship with God. Get this, everybody. Only a relationship with God can make you truly secure and give you what you need. An idol can never take the place of a relationship with the living God. And that's why at the end of 1 John, he writes, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So as we're coming through 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is going to give both scriptural and logic, logical arguments here. He says in verse 15, appealing to the Corinthians, I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. In other words, think about what I'm presenting to you today. Think about this. Now he's going to warn them about inconsistency. Because is it inconsistent to have communion today, to eat the bread, to drink the juice, 
and then to run after an idol right after service? Is that an inconsistency? What do you think? Absolutely. And God doesn't want us to be inconsistent. He wants us to be totally dedicated to himself, period. Now, in verse 16, you got two questions. If you get a yes answer, what is it prefaced with? Can anybody give that to me? An ooh. You got it. You got to get that ooh. Yeah. You got two ooh questions in verse 16. Both expect a yes or a positive answer. First one, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Communion was derived from the Passover, and it was the third cup of wine during the Passover meal, if you will, that transferred over into the Lord's Supper. Here's the point. If you're having the wine, one cup was probably passed around as they had communion. Everybody partook of it. How can you, if you will, not only participate in worshiping the Lord, but then after, if you will, service, running down to the temple and getting engaged with the immorality and the practices there? How can you do that? Get what Paul's getting, pointing at? Then he asks another question. The second question, verse 16. The bread which we bless, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? They would pray over the communion bread. And distribute it. And verse 17 points out something fascinating. There was probably one loaf of bread. And you see, what would happen is you would have that one loaf and you would take a piece, and that would be for you, and you would pass it on. Because what are we, everybody? We are one body. We are the body of Christ. And the one body that Christ died for in order that we, if you will, could be solely dedicated to him. But when you start to have bad doctrine creep in, if you will, bad teaching, and you start allowing the, the, if you will, mindset of this world to encroach upon your thinking, then it leads always to bad living. Bad doctrine, bad living. Turn over, you're in 1 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 with me, please. Next book over, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I always hear verse 14 referred in the context of marriage. It has nothing to do with marriage. If you want to know who to marry in the sense of can I marry an unbeliever, the answer is no because 1 Corinthians 7.39 says you marry only in the Lord. You only have one option when you get married, that's to marry a Christian, period. Okay. This is dealing with the false teachers that have crept into the church. Those individuals who are trying to undo the doctrine that Paul had taught them, the doctrine of grace, God's favor, that salvation is by grace alone. They said you have to go back to a system of works. You've got to go back to the law. They call them the Judaizers. And in verse 14, the present imperative basically here means stop doing this. Stop doing what? Stop being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You got it? He's saying to the Corinthians, you should not be, if you will, having a vital relationship with the unsaved people. What do I mean by being yoked? By becoming one. The yoke was something that was used for the oxen that you would take two, if you will, two oxen and put them together. It was the yoke that bound them together. What should we not be bound with? The unsaved. Do we rub shoulders with them? Yes. Do we try to evangelize them? Yes. Do we try to build friendships with them? Yes. But do we allow their thinking and the doctrine of this world to infiltrate our thinking? And that's where we have to say no. Five questions now Paul asks. All rhetorical questions. You know the answer already, essentially. Follow these. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? None. And what communion has light with darkness? Again, none. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Belial originally meant a worthless person. Came to be used as Satan. Can I ask you a question? What does Satan and Christ have in common? So when you choose, if you will, to be yoked together with unbelievers and you're representing Christ and the other person represents Satan, what do you have in common? Anybody see what's going on here? It's called amalgamation. Syncretism. It's called the blending, if you will. What happens so often is that Satan creeps up to the life of the Christian and he tries to entice you with someone or something of this world to get you yoked together so that you are compromised and you're not solely dedicated to God. And when you start to move in that direction, you are valueless for Christ and you are not a witness for him and you are not a shining light. 
and if you will, Satan's desire is to quench the fire, to get the embers to go out. That's what he wants to do. Notice here he continues, end of verse 15, and you, you folks, you need to get this. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Next question, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? No agreement. For you, and that's you plural, speaking of the church of Corinth, speaking about believers today, for you are the temple of the living God. You understand today, God's presence is not manifest in a temple in Jerusalem. God's presence is manifest through you and me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, we need to be solely dedicated to our God that people look at our lives and understand that's a dedicated Christian. That is someone who shines for Jesus Christ. That is an individual whose body has been dedicated for the glory of God. You get it? That's who we are. This is what we are called to be. God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, notice three commands in verse 17. If you have the mingling going on, if you have the yoking going on that should not be taking place, these three commands are for you. If you have embraced false doctrine, this is for you. Number one, first command is come out. Come out from among them. Number two, he says, be what? Separate. Walk away says the Lord. And notice number three, do not touch what is unclean. And I love the end of verse 17, and I will receive you. He's writing to believers. He's basically saying, I will have a special relationship with you if you are fully dedicated to me and you walk away from the things that are ungodly. Do you want that? Do you want the relationship with Christ? Does that mean more to you than anything else? See, if not then you have bought into the thinking of this age that this world can somehow satisfy what's deep down in your heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says eternity is in our hearts. No one can fill that void but a relationship with the Almighty. See? And that relationship, look at verse 18, and I will be a father to you. And some of you maybe don't know what it's like to have a father's influence in your life, a godly father. Almighty God says, I'll be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Notice what it says, not from some filthiness. See, today we're degree Christians. Oh, the world ranks at PG, or the world ranks at R, the world ranks at G. You know, I just read a study just the other day that even in the G movies, you have more sexual content than ever before. And the facts are out, and it's like this is no surprise to the Christian community, that when you're being inundated with relationships and hints of immorality, that you're going to be moved to immorality yourself. Why should that surprise us? It's all in a thinking and we take sometimes our kids to see the most vile things, and we're going to wonder why at age 13 my daughter or my son is out having sex with someone, and we're going to wonder why at age 15 she's pregnant or he's gotten someone pregnant. It's because we have filled their minds with filth, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. We evaluate all things by the standards of the Word of God. We do not allow Disney. We do not allow anybody with their human rating system to say, oh, this is a system you need to abide by. I've got a standard. It's called the Word of God. I go to the book of Ephesians. I look at what it says about coarse jesting. I look at what it says about potty humor. I look at what it says about these things, and it says you abstain from them because I want to know the Lord. You have to be purged from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. And then you have another question, and you're, you're, you're getting what's going on here. Another yes question, if you will. First of all, he says in verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? And the answer is yes. Both priests, right, and people alike partook of the sacrifice. In other words, if that is being is going on, then why in the world would you walk away from that sacrifice and the one you're worshiping and move over to a sacrifice for the idols of this age? Don't do it. Can I tell you something about idolatry too? Idols can never deliver. 
I don't care what you worship, if it's not the true God, it can't deliver. There's no piece of stone, there's no wood, there's no amount of money. There is no person that can just bring total deliverance. There's only one in the universe that brings deliverance. That's Almighty God. The idols will bring you up short every time. Actually, in Psalm 115, it says, you know, what do, what do we know about the idols? They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. And everyone who makes them are like them. Catch the word dumb. Dumb. That's the point the writer makes. And please understand this. If there's nothing else that you get today, I want you to understand this. There is a spirit behind what is enticing you into this world system. In Luke chapter 4, at verses 5 and 6, you know what Satan does? He says, hey, Jesus, come on. Give you a little tour. Took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. And he somehow showed him all the kingdoms of this world and all its glory. Can you imagine isn't that what Alexander the Great wanted? He wanted to conquer the world. Isn't that what Napoleon wanted? Isn't that what Hitler wanted? They wanted to conquer the entire world. And here is Satan showing it to Jesus. He says, I have this authority. It's been given to me. All you need to do is fall down and worship me, and I'll give it to you. Wow. Can I ask you, what was behind the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes of the pride of life? What was behind this world system? What is it that Satan is offering? You've got to look beyond the physical to the spiritual. Do you have to see that there is, if you will, a demonic spirit behind what was being offered to Jesus Christ? This is what Paul says in verse 20. And I hope this scares the dickens out of you. That before you start, if you will, moving in alternate directions and you start thinking about, oh, I'm going to find my fulfillment in relationships. And it doesn't matter, Christian or non-Christian, and I'm going to go have physical relationships, and that's going to be my fulfillment. I want you to understand behind that allurement, behind what is being offered, that doesn't come from God. There's another spirit that's behind that. Look at verse 20. Rather the things with the Gentiles see the heathen sacrifice, they sacrifice the demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Now, I don't think anybody here would consciously go, you know what? Man, bring the demons on. I want to hang out with the wicked ones. But in essence, when we bow down to the idols of this age, that's exactly what we're buying into. And it was no different than Old Testament Israel. They went into Canaan. They were to destroy the Canaanites. But what, what was their problem? That everywhere they went, they didn't do that. And all of a sudden, they started running out. The guys saw the chicks. And the chicks saw the guys, and they started commingling, and they started worshiping the idols of the land. And next thing you know, they were full-blown idolaters, and God wasn't pleased. Let me show this to you, Psalm 106. Would you turn back there, please? Middle of your Bible, about Psalm 117 or 118. If you go slightly to your left, you'll come up to Psalm 106. And the psalmist is given a history lesson. It's one that we need to take to heart. Psalm 106 Verse 34, the psalmist writes, they did not destroy the people. Because remember what was supposed to happen with many of the foreign nations that were sin infested and disease infested? The Israelites would have wiped them out, but they didn't do what they were commanded to do. It continues, concerning whom the Lord had commanded them. Look at verse 35. This is Psalm 106, 35. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. Got the mingling aspect? They were clubbing it. And at the end of the time at the club, they just had an orgy. Strong graphic terms, but the reality of what was going on in that day and age. And God's not pleased. Verse 36, they serve their idols. God had warned them. In Deuteronomy 7, when you see their altars, tear them down. When you observe their idols, destroy their idols. But the Israelites did not. So they served their idols, which became a snare to them. Verse 37, they even sacrificed their sons and their daughters. To whom? To demons. 
And I'm not so sure we're not sacrificing our sons and our daughters in this generation. And many Christians are doing it, selling them out to this world system. It's in a different way. They might not be casting them into the fire to Moloch, but they're casting them into fire nonetheless. And we're getting more and more corruption earlier and earlier on. And the world would like to say, oh, just blame the other political party that you're against. And the Bible says, look to the Christian. Look to the compromise. Look to how we're sacrificing ourselves and our, our own children to things that God says they should not partake of. Verse 38, they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and a land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Boy, strong terminology, playing the harlot. That's exactly what they did. Let me start to bring this to a, a close, and you'll see where we're going with all this. Back to 1 Corinthians 10. Notice, and we're going to wrap up with verse 22, but let's look at 21 first. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. See, you cannot have communion on the one hand here, and then run, if you will, to the temple and worship the demons. That's a mixed message for the Christian. And it's not acceptable. We can't do that. See, in verse 21, you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Do you know you have to make a choice, my friend, and don't ever miss this. If you will, today we come to the fork in the road. We do. Where you have to decide if you're going right or if you're going to go left. Because in Matthew chapter 6, and I trust this will be up on the screen in a second, it says very clearly that you cannot serve how many masters? Two, you cannot have two masters for either you will hate the one and love the other or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man in material possessions. Which is it? Who are you really going to serve? Who are you going to trust with your souls? Who are you going to trust with your possessions? Who are you going to trust with your children? Who are you going to trust? After a while, the four comes in a road and you've got to make a decision. Because the waffle, or as we used to say, to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church is not acceptable. Jesus Christ says, I bought you at a price. I laid down my life for you. I shed my blood. I have bought you. You are mine. So now separate from the idolatrous practices of this generation because you can't serve two masters. And if you don't bow down to the true God, you know what you're doing? You're provoking him. You're provoking him. In verse 22, it says, or do you, we provoke the Lord to jealousy? God is a jealous God. Ask Nadab and Abihu, remember in Leviticus chapter 10? Sons of the high priest Aaron, they were drunk. They came into the presence of the Lord to offer sacrifices, and God struck them dead on the spot. You know why they provoke God to jealousy? Ask Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6. He's a Kohathite. He wasn't to touch the ark of God. But what did he do when it was on the cart that it shouldn't have been? The oxen rattled the cart. He went to grab the ark of the covenant, and God struck him dead on the spot. Think about it for just a moment, what God does. How about Ananias and Sapphira? They were the hypocrites. They wanted to pretend that they were giving all this money to the things of the Lord, when in actuality, all they wanted was a pat on the back. That was their idol. They wanted a praise of men more than a praise of God. And God struck one, and God struck the other, and the people carried them out. And the question that is asked at the end of verse 22, are we stronger than he? Are we stronger than God? The idea is no. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal. It's written by uh, Leonard Mialdenau. And it's a, it's a funny little story about Joe DiMaggio. The year was 1945. The war had just ended. And back in those days, no matter if you were a ball player or not, when the country went to war, you went out with them. DiMaggio was gone. He was just coming back as streams of soldiers were coming back from the war zones. And he was trying to sneak into Yankee Stadium with his son to watch a game without being recognized. He was with Joe Jr. And as he went up into the mezzanine seat, somebody recognized him, and then someone else, and then someone else, and they started chanting, Joe, Joe, Joe. 
And before you know it, the whole stadium's yelling, Joe DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio. The father looked at little Joe to see if his son understood what was going on. <laughs> and how cute, only a kid could say this. See, Daddy, said the little DiMaggio, everyone knows me. <laughs> Steve Farish uh, wrote a paper for the Evangelical Theological Society in 2009, and this is what he wrote. The junior Joe DiMaggio made the innocent child's mistake of assuming all the glory at the Yankee Stadium that summer afternoon in 1945 belonged to him and not to his father. Human beings, however, make a far less innocent mistake when we live as if our lives were all about us and our glory rather than about our Heavenly Father and His glory. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 1.21 that the fundamental sin of the human heart involves a purposeful failure to honor God as God and to give thanks to Him, that is, to give the Lord the glory in the form of worship that He alone is due. Here's the main point. Flee from idolatry because you cannot serve two masters. Got it? Flee from idolatry because you cannot serve two masters. One last text, a brief one, and we'll close on this. Joshua chapter 24. Would you turn there, please? I love Joshua. Joshua was one of the faithful men who had spied out the land of Canaan. He and Caleb came back, basically said, hey, let's go take the land. God's promised it to us. It's ours. Got to love it. All they did was they took God at his word. They were ready to act upon it. But the other ten spies gave a bad report. And remember what happened. God consumed them by fire. Joshua now has been faithful. He actually did the divide and conquer motto. Because when they crossed the Jordan River, they went into the land of Canaan. See, they divided the peoples up, the Canaanites. Then he went south. Then he went north. And they took a lot of the land, but not all of it. He's about to die. And in Joshua 24, verses 15, 14 and 15, this is what he leaves the nation with. And I leave this to you. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Notice in verse 15, everybody, so key. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day, whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Heads of homes today, fathers or mothers, is, is that you? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're not going to serve the false gods. We're not going to go out and be idolaters. We're going to worship the true God, and that is what I'm going to practice in my life, and that is what I'm going to, if you will, model for my family, and that is what I'm going to instruct them to do. Can I ask you today, are you there? Have you had enough of the foolishness of this world? You know, when you see the old alcohol commercials, you know, I, I wonder why they never showed anybody, you know, wrapped the side of a pole just after having a car accident or maybe running over someone they didn't see. I wonder why they don't show that. Or when they show the people all partying and, and, and going to the club, why don't, why don't they show what a venereal disease is like or an unwanted pregnancy? Why don't we see that? Why don't we see the things that are horrific that Satan brings about so often because he has enticed people into places that they should not be? When will we get it and repent? When will we say, that is wrong? I've known what has been right all my life. I've just chosen not to do it. But today, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I think it's very clear the choice that you have. This world system and its so-called gods, 